Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. This week, we are going to dive into the air war over Ukraine. Media reports have largely focused on the ground war, but the opening stages of the conflict saw a fierce air battle, and it's still happening. We need to discuss this because it's challenged a lot of the assumptions about the Russian Air Force and what a modern air campaign looks like against advanced systems and a determined enemy. Unfortunately, many pundits are drawing the exact wrong conclusion to this fight. Today, we'll talk about how the Russians and Ukrainians have been employing, what they are bringing to the fight, and what it means for the wider war. We'll also look at what lessons can be learned by NATO and the United States as war rages in Europe and adversaries around the globe evaluate the Western response. We are incredibly fortunate to have a special guest with us today, all the way from the United Kingdom and the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies, Dr. Justin Bronk. He's an absolute authority on the modern combat environment. He's published an extensive report for RUSI in November on the air war and recently returned from a trip to Ukraine and is bringing back firsthand accounts from the front. So, Justin, welcome to the show. Hi there. We also have our very own Heather Lucky Penny, senior fellow at the Mitchell Institute. Hey, Slick, it's great to be back. And finally, one of our Air Force fellows, Mike Mongo Kingry, is joining us for the conversation. He's an active duty Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who just wrapped up commanding the 56th Rescue Squadron at Aviano Air Base in Italy, flying HH-60s. We have Mongo here with us this year as part of the Mitchell team. So Mongo, welcome. Thanks, Slick. Good to be here. All right, so let's set the scene for our listeners here. On February 24th, Russian forces launched their invasion against Ukraine with a concerted air campaign using everything from long-range cruise missiles to advanced fighters and attack helicopters. We were all following along uh, and watching videos of Russian fixed-wing aircraft launching strikes and massive formations of helicopters trespassing uh, at the border and at low altitude. So, Justin, can you give us a sense for what the size, composition, and weapons uh, of that initial force look like? Sure. Uh, So essentially, the the initial campaign began, as you might expect, with a concerted electronic attack and uh, standoff cruise missile and ballistic missile salvo. Those were uh, fired from a combination, uh, the the standoff weapons that is, fired from a combination of surface ships and subs in the Black Sea in terms of caliber, uh, a degree of... um, uh, mixing of cruise and ballistic missiles from Iskander uh, ground-based launchers. So Iskander is the name of the launcher. Uh, the 9M723, which I, I know is a, a real zinger of a name, uh, is the what, what a lot of people refer to as the Iskander. It's the ballistic missile. Um, the more modern of the two, there's also the 9M720. And then also the 9M728, which is the cruise missile that the Iskander also fires. Uh, and then the, the majority of the cruise missiles, though, coming from uh, Russian long-range aviation, so uh, Tupolev-95 and Tupolev-160 um, long-range strategic bombers, which have also a nuclear mission. So uh, the the long-range aviation, or LRA, has been pretty active throughout the war and, and consistently performed pretty well. Um, but they were uh, out in force in, during that kind of initial um, first strike. In addition, uh, there were around 140 to 150 sorties from uh, Russian fixed-wing uh, fighters and fighter bombers, um, so all frontal bombers, as the the uh, VKS would would doctrinally term the the Su-34. Um, so those were conducting a mix of standoff um, anti-radiation missile launches, as well as uh, some sort of fighter caps, and penetrating sorties, usually in singletons, um, as well as a couple of you know about twenty five percent of of those penetrating sorties were in pairs, and um, one or two very slightly larger. Although the largest formation seen by the Ukrainians that day was about six, uh, and so those those airstrikes were really going after the same sort of targets as the the cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, i.e., Ukrainian air defense sites. Uh, very much a, a <clears throat> shock and awe attempt, in the sense of going after the the Ukrainian ground based air defense system. 
uh, and to a degree some of its air bases, but uh, not with nearly the same effectiveness. And yeah, just generally speaking, uh, on a smaller scale than than the West would would see, both in terms of uh, numbers of sorties, enablers in particular, and also strike weight. So the Russian plan initially was very much to um, basically force a regime change and insert a client regime. So the the plan was to suppress the Ukrainian air defense system, destroy sites, particularly along the the routes that the helicopter insertions were going in. So this would be the the particularly the famous assault on Hostomel. There were also some helicopter insertion attempts down south and on the uh, western border of Ukraine, that is, um, mostly by by uh, Spetsnaz and, and some VDV elements, so VDV being being Russian uh, airborne troops. The, the routes were kind of the, the main focus, as I said, for the, the air defense suppression and, and to a degree destruction attempts. Um, and the aim really was to uh, capture Hostomel Airport while ground forces essentially drove to encircle the major cities, Kharkiv, Kiev, uh, Kherson in the south, Mariupol as well, uh, and Melitopol, and essentially decapitate the regime using rap- forces rapidly inserted into Hostomel Airport. So they, they were going to land uh, IL-76 transports um, with more airborne forces um, at Hostomel Airport, which is on the outskirts of, Hi- of Kiev, uh, as well as, of course, the the, the thrusts driving in from um, Belarus and from Belgorod. Uh, so very much an attempt to decapitate Ukraine, uh, to capture its leadership or force them to flee, uh, and then insert a Russian client um, sort of layer of power and try and convert the the processes of the Ukrainian state to work for a client regime in, in a repressive way, much as we see in Belarus, where the, the of course the you know re- essentially client um, Lukashenko regime uh, is is the front face of the repression, but it's backed up by the Russian armed forces. Um, and so in that sense, that may account for why some of the strike weight was lower than you might have expected, because the Russians essentially were trying to capture the country, not destroy it per se. Justin, that was an awesome breakdown. Thank you for that. Um, how does the initial Russian employment fit with how we know or what we know about Russian doctrine regarding their use of air power? Uh, we've seen a lot of the defense and security community here in the United States project our air power uh, doctrine concepts onto the Russian campaign, you know, basically a mirror image. So help us reset. What do we know about uh, Russian doctrine and how well did the Russian Air Force perform against that? So the, the, the position of the VKS, uh, so the, the Russian Aerospace Forces in Russian Doctrine, uh, is essentially a, a, a mix of an ability to facilitate long-range precision strikes. So either with, with standoff cruise missiles, not just from the bigger bombers, but also things like KH-59, uh, an air launch cruise missile that could be fired from the flanker series and was fired in significant numbers in the first few days of the war by uh, Sukhoi-34 and, and also sometimes Sukhoi-30 and 35. Um, and you know they, they have a range of reasonably capable standoff munitions, but they're generally capable against targets that either show up on radar, um, so you can get a, a an all weather um, radar um, nav point essentially, or a target a weapon aiming point, or that are fixed and known. So you can use a mix of GLONASS or GPS with inertial navigation and, and often things like TV guidance for the, the kind of terminal phase of weapons. So they, they have a role for going after fixed targets, um, both from standoff and potentially stand in. But their primary role really is, is as a sort of backup, the, the second layer, um, second fiddle, if you like, to the ground-based air defense network, the, the integrated air defense system that, that Russia deploys. So all of the, the sort of famous you know, long-range systems, S-400, S-300 V-4, um, anti-2500, um, and the, the sort of command vehicles and, and command architecture that link all of those up and form, at least when they're in place, rather than moving, form a, a coherent network with the, the more numerous medium-range mobile things, SA-17, for example, or 15. Um, and you know that really is where Russia's primary um, focus, essentially, in the air domain is, is in ground-based air defense, because ultimately they see Western air power as something they can't compete with toe-to-toe in the air domain, and it's in aerial combat, as it were. So it's they, they kind of respond to it with the mix of, of producing this very dense layered IADs, 
um, integrated air defense system and having a lot of long range precision strike capabilities to threaten things like Western uh, combined air operation centers, air operation centers, main air bases, um, you know, core divisional hub, uh, logistics hubs, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it, it, when they when you're looking at Ukraine, it, does it fit with their doctrine? Not necessarily, although as we saw in Syria uh, and previously in Georgia, you know the, the the VKS is still supposed to have a secondary capability to project power against sub peers, i.e., against nations that are not NATO. And in the Russian mindset, particularly um, pre February twenty fourth, um, Ukraine was very much seen as a sub peer that would be sort of pretty quickly um laid out and decapitated so in that sense does it fit with their doctrine loosely but it wasn't the sort of force employment you would expect to see if they were going up against a nato force you know it's like i think justin brought up a few points that are really worth foot stomping so first of all the vks the russian air force does not look like and it's not intended to operate like a western air force so take air superiority for example in the west we expect an integrated mission package of fighters, ISR platforms, electronic warfare, air battle management, and other specialties to execute suppression and destruction of enemy air defenses, conduct offensive and defensive counter air, and to destroy or render airfields and aircraft unusable, as well as conduct operations against other important targets. In comparison to how we would operate, as Justin noted, the largest Russian mission package the Ukrainians saw was about six VKS aircraft. And even while we are fighting to establish air superiority, even when it's contested, we are still exploiting the air domain to conduct other offensive and defensive operations. All this creates an environment that enables other service components to successfully operate in their domain. So Justin made the point that Russia knows it can't compete in a similar way which is why it's weighted most of its air doctrine and its air force on ground-based air defense systems and surface missiles. So Justin has characterized it perfectly. The VKS is subordinate to ground forces and the Russian military writ large is an artillery force. The VKS, the Russian Air Force, does not really have a dedicated seed or deed force, suppression of enemy air defenses or destruction of enemy air defenses, because that's just simply not doctrinal for them. I mean, and think about it. The United States and many Western allies don't have robust ground-based air defenses. They depend on air power to provide the cover for their maneuver. So the VKS's ability to conduct C and D is fairly rudimentary. It focuses primarily on fixed targets and electronic warfare. Now, electronic warfare matters to Russian operations because it sidesteps their need to kinematically destroy systems. Electronic warfare, the way the Russians intend to use it, will break many links in the kill chain or the effects chain. For example, if you can use electronic warfare to blind radars, jam data links, render communications unusable, then you can paralyze an opposing force and you don't have to blow it up. So many US-based defense analysts were surprised when they didn't see a Western-style air command. But we have to grade the VKS based off of their doctrine and concept of operations, not ours. That said, I think what was surprising was Russia's inability to exploit its electronic warfare capabilities. At the outset of this conflict, Russia didn't coordinate or deconflict their electronic warfare. And as a consequence, they jammed their own forces, effectively conducting electronic fratricide, making their operations ineffective and confused. They just simply couldn't execute. This gave the Ukrainians breathing room breathing room they needed to move their air defense systems and to adapt. Why did the Russians muck this first phase up? Probably planning and deconfliction. They just didn't do it. But we've seen since, in more recent operations, far more effective employment of their jamming electronic warfare. But that also means that they have to create windows in time and space that is where there's clear spectrum so that they too can operate. But their missteps in this first part of the conflict ultimately allowed the Ukrainians the time needed to adapt and disperse their ground-based air defense systems, which is why we see the air domain contested even to this day. Now, Mongo, you've been following the air war and are coming to us with, uh, you know, recent operational experience in Europe. What jumps out uh, at you, uh, you know, during these initial stages? Thanks, Slick. I think 
you know, Justin kind of touched on it here earlier, but really, what really jumped out to me was the reticence and the reluctance of the Russians to use formation and force packaging to reach some of their, you know, to achieve some of their desired objectives. And Justin does a great job of laying this out in his report. But what we see is a lot of their strikes are happening in singletons. I think about 25% of the time, as he alluded to, they're in formations and there's very little uh, to no employment with more than six aircraft, which coming from an Air Force background, you know, that's kind of our bread and butter. It's kind of kind of mind blowing. So in the Air Force, we put a huge premium on mutual support, on flight leadership, on force packaging. I mean, if you go into an Air Force squadron and pull a pilot out of a bar, they're going to tell you that the, the most demanding things they do are their flight lead upgrade, their mission commander upgrade. We make huge investments in things like red flag and weapon school integration phases where we really stress you know, pre-planning, you know, common data passage standards, uh, layered effects, contingency operations, and we really stress those things. And to see now the Russians kind of, to Heather's point, not really how they employ, but to see them attempting a, a modern air campaign without utilizing those elements is a little bit, little bit shocking. And frankly, I don't know how you, how you execute a campaign like that without exercising some of those basic muscles. Mongo, you mentioned integrated mission packages of different and synergistic capabilities as being core to the modern air campaign. But I was shocked when I read in Justin's report that uh, the VKS only had about 100 combat mission-ready pilots available at the start of combat operations. Now, I just finished saying that we have to grade the VKS on their own doctrine, not ours. So, I mean, we understand that, uh, that they don't operate the same way we do. But I have to wonder how they expected to execute which was with such a small number of current and qualified pilots. I mean, how could they have been competent with such an unready force? So we should look at perhaps some of the structural weaknesses of the VKS, their training, for example, that could also explain why they did not perform at the level that the West expected. Uh, just to jump in there, I mean, I, I agree entirely, Heather, but it, the one thing I would say is, um, you know, if we were to look in the mirror in Europe, um, less the US, although um, that's partly because the US has been on a bit of a crash course to try and get back to um, greater readiness with warfighting competencies across uh, active duty squadrons, but um, you know, if you look at most Western Air Forces, if you were to take a, a, a kind of a canvas um, on, let's say, if you had a week, because of course one of the key uh, factors underlying the entire Russian start of the war was that the military just weren't told below the general staff level until the the kind of just a few hours before they were going in. You know, if you were to take even a week, how many of the sort of nominal aircrew cadre of most European NATO air forces would be classed as you know multi-role combat ready uh, for a high intensity environment. You know, I, I would I would hazard a guess that it's likely to be a, a slightly uncomfortably low number. Justin, I, I'm glad you pushed back on that. I fully agree with you. I mean, I'm in violent agreement because that capacity and that readiness matters. You know, in the West, both the United States and our allies, especially NATO, our air forces are all too small for what will be demanded of us, and our forces are not at the readiness levels they need. And here, Russia's dismal air performance is a cautionary tale. We must not continue in our complacency with respect to our own air force's capacity and, importantly, readiness. It's worth remembering that both the Russian army and the Ukrainian army are primarily artillery armies. They, they are large forces with huge amounts of infantry, huge amounts of tanks and artillery. I mean, we, we, we you know, a lot of people kind of characterize Ukraine a bit as, you know, sort of scrappy underdog who, you know, <laughs> clinging on with very little equipment against this behemoth that is Russia. And certainly it, it you know, was definitely massively outnumbered and, and outgunned, particularly in terms of long-term artillery stocks. But Ukraine started the war with more than way over a thousand tube artillery pieces and more than a thousand rocket artillery pieces, plus huge stockpiles of ammunition for them. And yeah, I think about 900 main battle tanks, 700 to 900 main battle tanks. Yeah. That, is, that is far more than any European power with the exception of Finland. Um, and even Finland has, has significantly smaller numbers. It's just a comparative to size that you know Finland is, is up there. But you know, if you look across NATO, we are very, very dependent on air-delivered firepower for joint force lethality. Now, that's a deliberate choice. That's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's what enables us to have relatively small, relatively efficient 
um, you know, land and maritime forces that can be afforded um, at kind of 2% or, or, or around that of GDP. Um, that, that so-called peace dividend, but it also means that our forces are, are not designed and, or expected to fight the sort of grueling, attritional, very, very high casualty sort of war that both Ukraine and Russia have been fighting uh, since February. You know, tens of thousands of dead on either side in terms of, of military dead as well as, of course, civilians on Ukraine's side. And so the fact that we have chosen not to fight that way and to build our armed forces around this this presumption that we're going to have air superiority and therefore be able to deliver overwhelming precision firepower from the sky as a way of compensating for not going down the massed artillery and armored infantry route um, does mean that we depend on being able to have air superiority for our, our joint forces to actually function as designed. Whereas for Russia and Ukraine, I mean, for Russia, clearly it's been a it's been a huge blow to not have air superiority. Ukraine couldn't have done a lot of what it's done if Russia had air superiority, particularly things like keeping high Mars and you know marshalling large numbers of troops relatively safe, more than about 50 kilometers behind the lines. But both of their armies still have the majority of their firepower. So air, air denial is not critical for either of them, even though it, it has saved Ukraine that the Russians were denied. For us, it would be absolutely critical. So, you know, air superiority is required unless we want to re-engineer our entire joint force, and that's far more expensive than fixing the, the anti-access problem, which is essentially what air's problem is. Well, I, I think we're seeing here what's happening now with the lack of air superiority. Like, we're it's kind of back to the future here now. It looks a little bit like, you know, the Western Front in the, in the First World War where we see these protracted, you know, uh, protracted conflict, highly attritional with a, with a lack of air superiority. Well, and from Justin, that's a mic drop. Mongo, thanks for that breakdown. Uh, Justin, your report lays out a fascinating analysis on the opening salvo uh, of the air war. Uh, in particular, you talk about the overmatch between you know, the Ukrainian MiG-29s and Su-27s versus the Russian Su-30s and Su-35. So talk to us more about this and some of the novel ways Ukrainians tried to you know, get around their shortcomings. Yeah, so the uh, the Ukrainians essentially had to hold the line in air defense terms with their fighter force in the first three days of the war, particularly the first two, because of that opening Russian physical salvo in terms of all of the, the cruise missiles as well as fixed-wing airstrikes and ballistic missile strikes uh, and the electronic suppression. The uh, Ukrainian air defense system on the ground was essentially... Uh, part blinded and largely suppressed because it had to be moving. So everything that essentially wasn't mobile um, was at serious risk of being hit and destroyed. Uh, Russian poor battle damage assessment did lessen the effect of what what would have been uh, potentially effective follow-up strikes on some fixed, fixed targets, but particularly in the south where there were some older systems as well as systems with poorer maintenance for chassis and things, uh, so things like SA-3 that can't move, as well as some older S S-300 PS and PT. Uh, there was quite a lot of physical destruction. But in general, r Ukrainian radars, ground-based radars were were jammed and in some cases um, you know, electronically damaged. Uh, and so they were having to be kind of reset and, and, and reformatted, and in some cases moved. And the Ukrainian medium-range systems, particularly SA-11 and uh, so book and uh, SA-8 OSA and, and the S-300s that could move were, were all repositioning uh, desperately to avoid these these you know, standoff and fixed-wing strikes. So the Ukrainian fighters really had to hold the line for, for the first three days while the Ukrainian air defenses kind of reset, repositioned uh, and regrouped. And they started to come back in, in, in the third, from the third day onwards. Uh, very effectively. But during those first three days, the Ukrainian fighters found, first of all, they were completely outmatched, technically speaking, uh, as well as grossly outnumbered in practical terms. Um, but essentially, the Russian Su-30SM and Su-35S, uh, the, the two primary fighter aircraft, in particular the Su-35, uh, had massively more potent radars um, and also were able to fly higher and faster. Um, because the Ukrainian uh, jets were facing a serious ground-based air defense threat from Russian long-range um, ground-based air defenses, so S-300s, S-400 S, uh, uh, systems. So the the Russians were at a significant kinematic advantage. They were higher and they were high at high altitude and, and fast, generally about eight thousand meters, um, and fast. While the Ukrainians were having to fly low. The Russians had a much more capable radar systems, so the Urbis-E and the, the BARS, uh, 
which are fitted to the the uh, Su35S and Su30SM respectively. And they not only have significantly greater range, significantly greater uh, look down, shoot down um, performance, but they also have much better burn through against uh, in, a, in an electronic attack saturated environment, which this very much was. There was a lot of electronic attack going on, um, particularly Russian jamming, which uh, does have fratricidal tendencies. So the ability to burn through a lot of that noise jamming, um, very valuable on the Russian side. Uh, and they also had, for example, track while scan capabilities, being able to uh, you know, target Ukrainian aircraft while still scanning for others, to launch uh, active radar equipped missile, uh, active radar seeker missiles, the R-77-1 in particular, so AA-12B uh, in NATO parlance. Um, and those missiles themselves not only significantly uh, outrange in in kind of like for like terms the R-27R and a few ERs that the, the Ukrainian fighters were having to rely on. But those R-77s are also A, being launched from much higher and faster again. So that kinematic advantage greatly increasing the imbalance in missile range. And the R-77-1 is also an active FOX-3. So um, it could be fired on a track while scan uh, bearing, not giving the, the targeted aircraft necessarily a radar warning receiver spike that you would get from a single target track or STT lock. Um, and also once the missile goes active, um, so generally about seven to eight seconds um, before impact, the launch fighter can turn away. Uh, and even if the the, the guidance, the, the semi-active guidance is broken by the fighter having to turn cold to defend itself, um, the missile theoretically when it goes active could still acquire the target. So much more tactically flexible, um, even though the Russians were making relatively poor use of a lot of their R-77 shots, firing them at very long range and often turning away almost immediately. Um, so, so probably going cold or, or at least on the edge of gimbal limits. Um, the Ukrainians, by contrast, are having to already fly low to avoid long range um, S-400 and S-300 V-4 uh, SAM shots from across the border. Um, Russian shots, that is, but also because of the, the huge radar range, radar performance, missile range and missile performance disparity between the Russian fighters and their own, and the fact that the Russians had AWACS support from A-50, uh, and the fact that the Russians outnumbered them, essentially they, they had to go all in on flying very, very low. So the Ukrainian pilots were trying to use terrain masking, things like river valleys, um, to get kind of underneath the radar search scans of these high altitude Russian fighter patrols and then kind of pop up and ambush from, from low altitude before flying down again, either strike packages or, or fighter aircraft um, higher up. They, the Ukrainians did manage to get several engagements where they claimed kills and uh, certainly we're finding additional um, Russian aircraft wrecks that uh, had, are being kind of discovered in areas that have been liberated, for example, around Kharkiv in particular. Um, which support the notion that during these these initial days, at least a few Russian aircraft were downed. But of course, the Ukrainians took massively greater casualties in return than they inflicted in fighter to fighter combat. And so while the Ukrainian Air Force demonstrated, demonstrated extreme, you know, extreme adaptability, great heroism in going up against these sort of extremely unfair odds, it really wasn't something that that could be done sustainably. The Ukrainian Air Force kind of takeaway from from those first few days being we, we can't do that again. Um, we can't put our fighter force toe to toe with the Russians, especially because initially the Russian fighters were also essentially coping with the fact that very little planning had been done, very little communications plan, um, you know, sequencing, deconfliction work had been done, uh, and they weren't really expecting a war. So, you know, th their performance in those first few days will have been significantly worse than their performance today would be. Okay, Lucky, we've seen on the Ukrainian side a lot about the TB2 uh, and other small drones. So does this mean the era of uh, traditional air power, you know, fighters, bombers, etc. is over? Uh, is the future really all small drones? It's like, it's been really great to see how the Ukrainians have been using drones and uncrewed systems. They've been extremely innovative. And I think that this proves that drones, whether small quadcopters, larger remotely piloted aircraft, or in the future, collaborative combat aircraft, drones are here to stay. They'll be a crucial part of any air campaign, and to be honest, an essential tool for every service. Take these smaller quadcopters. Every army platoon wants to know what's around the corner, over the hill, or over the next five hills. And these small drones put that ability directly into the hands of individual soldiers. And they're relatively cheap and expendable. It turns out this is good because, you know, if you look at Justin's paper, about 90% 
90% of the drones that have been employed in Ukraine have been attrited. So that also tells us something about how we need to stockpile these things. We need to treat drones more like expendables because of their short life and less like a weapon system. This is going to be a little bit challenging to manage because of the speed of technology. You know, think about what a small commercial drone today is. It's far more advanced than one that was built two years ago. And so even as though we recognize that we will need these smaller drones in spades, we also have to be deliberate about how we acquire and manage these inventories, especially given DOD procurement timelines. You know, another thing that folks need to think about, especially with respect to these smaller drones, is that the mission capabilities and the physical attributes of an aircraft are tightly related. So for example, these small quadcopters like we're seeing in Ukraine are range limited, slow, they're payload limited, and they can only stay airborne for short, short periods of time due to their battery life. They're also limited in how fast or high they can fly. So overall, their mission utility is fairly constrained. You know, for example, the New York Times recently had an article about uh, these smaller drones uh, being used by Ukrainian forces, and they're dropping hand grenades on Russian troops. Now, it's a great psychological weapon, but it doesn't really have a significant operational consequence. Now, larger drones, like the Turkish TB2, can have a greater operational effect, but they're also more expensive and vulnerable to traditional air defense systems. So again, this is why air superiority matters. If we really want to be able to make a difference in combat operations, you'll need to have the range of drones from these small quadcopters up to far more exquisite, more expensive ones. But all of this depends upon air superiority. Because if you simply, if you continue to allow ground-based air defense systems to freely operate and deny that airspace, it really doesn't matter uh, whether or not you've got these small quadcopters uh, or TB2s or, or any range in between. They're not going to live long enough to be effective. So again, let me point out that the operational effects of the drones, they've been limited. So they've had some spectacular mission successes, but their attrition really impacts not simply their sustainability, but their operational utility. So you have to have air superiority. And really what that means is the air traditional air power, fighters, bombers, and things that we as in the West think of as air power, it really only shows how much more important they are because of the limited operational utility of these drones, small or large, and the dramatic need. I mean, I think the demonstrated of air superior. Now, Lucky, there's been a notion floating around that the lesson to be learned from uh, the failure of the Russians to secure air superiority is that air denial can be just as effective as air superiority. So can you unpack what, you know, this idea of air denial is? And uh, is that the right way for the air domain to uh, pivot? Thanks, Lick. You know, I think it's really important to debunk this notion of air denial that's being pushed by Kelly Greco of the Atlantic Council and Max Bremer, an Air Force officer. Let me be clear. Air denial is a dangerous and morally irresponsible concept to buy into. Greco and Bremer contend that the failure of either the Russian or Ukrainian Air Force to establish air superiority holds implications for Western and U.S. modernization, recapitalization, and even established doctrine and operational concepts. In short, their argument is that because ground-based air defense systems are so effective, electronic warfare, cyber, long-range missiles are also effective, all of these capabilities make air power and the objective of air superiority obsolete. So why bother? First of all, they're starting from inaccurate assumptions that both Ukraine and Russia have mutually denied the air domain to each other. In truth, the air domain over Ukraine remains highly contested, and both the VKS and Ukrainian air forces continue to fight for some semblance of air superiority. I mean, take recent operations by Russia. They've deliberately targeted Ukrainian air defenses to push them back so they can bring their Russian fighters and bombers closer to the front. And again, we also have to look at how both the Ukrainian and Russian military forces are structured. Neither of them rely upon air power to do the heavy lifting of combat operations like the West does. As Justin noted, both Russia and Ukraine are primarily artillery and heavy armor militaries 
that look at air forces as airborne fires. The West uses air power in a fundamentally different way. In the West, air superiority creates the conditions which enable other services to operate and maneuver effectively in their domain without worrying about adversary air, whether that's adversary reconnaissance, attack, interdiction, or so forth. And any airman will tell you that beyond close air support and interdiction, air power is the indispensable force for all of our missions and how that impacts our joint operations. Bottom line, if you don't have an air force, you can't have a joint force. But the reason why I say that this notion of air denial is, immor is immoral is because of what we're seeing today. Without air superiority, this conflict in Ukraine has devolved into a grinding war of attrition and atrocity. It's dragged out longer than necessary. And now, with both sides digging trenches, it harkens back to World War I, a war of horrors that was directly causal in airmen developing air power so that we could go over and not through. We must be careful to not learn the wrong lesson here. Air denial may sound trendy, but it's not how you win wars. We should always seek to win and to win quickly because not losing drags out the cost of war in both treasure and lives. As the initial push to take Kiev falters, you know, the, the Russians uh, look to change their objectives. And as we all know, this meant shifting to the south around the Donbass and uh, Kershaw uh, region. Can you talk us and walk us through how the air war changed as the Russians adjusted their aims and limited uh, their strategic objectives? So the, the Russian employment of air power uh, essentially shifted to more or less its current model um, from around early April uh, onwards. So essentially, uh, following the the failed attempt to uh, suppress the Ukrainian air defense system uh, and certainly to destroy it, um, after it came back online progressively from the third day onwards, the, the Russian Air Force very quickly lost the ability to run penetrating sorties uh, into Ukraine, that is, penetrations into Ukrainian controlled airspace uh, at anything other than very low altitude. Um, over the, the sort of subsequent three days, uh, they lost a significant number of aircraft, and so they shifted to a different concept of operations, which was essentially trying to uh, go after targets at very low level, where, of course, the the um, effect of ground clutter and, and terrain masking and the curvature of the Earth uh, significantly limits the acquisition range of, of ground-based radar-directed SAM systems. But, of course, in, in doing that, First of all, the, they came down into the into the effective range of, of shoulder-fired man-portable air defense systems, manpads, um, of which the Ukrainian forces had large numbers. Um, and they started to lose large numbers of aircraft to that. They lost, uh, I think, about 11 aircraft in, in a week or so um, between around the, the 3rd and the, the 9th of March. And then, uh, you know, having decided that that was essentially, first of all, um, you know, not sustainable in terms of losses they also decided that based on 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 uh, very poor results so uh, after the first kind of week or so they they were tasked away from mostly uh, attempting to strike fixed uh, air defense sites towards trying to support the russian army that was you know bogged down by this point so they were trying to con conduct strikes against ukrainian positions but if you're flying at very very low level even by day um you get a very limited window of vision to your target. Um, so your ability to actually spot and then identify, let alone uh, aim weapons accurately, particularly free fall weapons or rockets, um, at targets accurately on a first pass is very low. Um, and especially given that, you know, in, in a lot of these cases, the, the uh, Ukrainian army is using a lot of the same sort of vehicles uh, and same sort of weapons as, as the Russians. So further compounding those identification uh, issues. The, and if you came came around for kind of second pass, if you'd ID'd something on your way for, pass for a first go, came back for a second pass, that's a very good way to get shot down because then every, everyone on the ground is, is alert and ready. Um, so then the Russians switched to uh, night low-level attacks. Um, that significantly limited the number of aircraft and aircrew who could be used because, first of all, uh, most of Russia's aircraft don't have a low-level night attack doctrinal role and so have not got specialist equipment nor 
bit nor training in terms of regular training for low level um, contested uh, strike operations. So from that point of view, generally limited to the, the Sukhoi 34 um, fullbacks, so the, the frontal bomber or fighter bomber as we would see it fleet from the fixed wing as well as the Camel 52s and a few of the Havocs and, and Heinz, the other gunships. Um, but also in terms of crews, you know, having started out with too few fully qualified um, combat ready multi-role aircrew, then if you add in the number of aircrew who are actually capable of doing that at night at very low level while people are shooting at you, that number of, of usable aircrew shrinks again dramatically. So it, essentially the having to move to low level and then to low level at night really curtailed the the, the number of penetrating sorties uh, that could be flown. So having to to switch to low level operations and, and then low level at night really curtailed, curtailed the number of, of sorties that could be flown and the number of crews and aircraft that could do it. And also meant that once they were flying at night, they were really only capable of hitting fixed targets again. So generally free fall bombs against besieged towns and cities, places like Chernihiv, Sumy, Kharkiv, Mariupol. Um, and that really wasn't hugely effective. It's, it's a way of terrorizing people and, and besieged areas, but it, it really wasn't particularly effective. And once the Ukrainians started getting night vision uh, goggles out to some of their manpads teams, as well as um, using things like the SA-8 um, short-range SAM system that, that has optics to be able to do, um, you know, search for and then shoot uh, at shorter ranges um, at, at low-level targets at night, they also started taking losses again at a lower lower rate, but you know, with with such a lower payoff for those losses, you can see why they stopped that by by around April. Um, with the shift to the Donbass, they essentially uh, were working on uh, getting a a degree of ability to operate at medium and higher altitudes near the front lines, so not necessarily crossing over to the Ukrainian side, and in fact, generally not doing that, but particularly with their Su-25, so their, their uh, Frogfoot attack, ground attack aircraft with helicopter gunships, with the Su-34 fleet, with some standoff munitions, particularly KH-29 um, TV-guided or laser-guided variants, the TNAL L variants, um, using those to, to kind of attack from medium or, or in some cases low-level um, frontline targets and also using their fighters as close to the lines as they could without taking too much surface to a missile fire to keep the Ukrainian Air Force back. So to, to use long range air to air missiles um, from high altitudes and to uh, fire KH-31 and, and older KH-58 anti-radiation missiles at Ukrainian SAMs. So it's sort of a, a mix of relatively old fashioned um, battlefield interdiction slash sort of flying artillery, as as, as uh, Lucky Penny sort of pointed out earlier, um, but also those those fighter patrols not penetrating into the Ukrainian uh, sort of held airspace on their side of the lines, and that really is what they continue to do today. Um, so that pattern has been going since essentially late April. Uh, the difference is that over time the Russians have got much much better, um, particularly from June onwards. Uh, using their Orlan 10, so their, their sort of relatively small purpose-built uh, fixed-wing UAV. They, they've been using those for um, essentially DIAD. So they've been, they, they operate in complexes of three at a time, um, where you will have a, an electronic warfare payload equipped one that will fly around above the range of man pads so at about 6,000 meters or five to 6,000 meters near the front lines, force Ukrainian SAMs to unmask because they don't know what payload it has, generally speaking. Um, so it could be doing artillery spotting and they're, they're primarily used for artillery spotting and it's very important to shoot them down because when there's an all-land up, they, the artillery response times can be as short as three minutes, so they, they must be destroyed. But then when Ukrainian SAMs open up on them, that electronic warfare payload is used to, to increase the survivability of the UAV. And in any case, even if it does get destroyed, they're relatively affordable, about eighty-five to $100,000. Um, but then they, the, the other ones in the complex, so an ELINT payload, so an electronics intelligence um, payload equipped one, will try and geolocate that surface to missile system that's just illuminated. Uh, and then an optical payload equipped one with a designator um, we'll, we'll try and actually fix it and then guide in either loitering munitions recently, so things like the Lancet 3 or occasionally modified Shahids, 
or um, you know just laser guided artillery shells or, or, or barrages of, of, of rocket or, or tube artillery. And that's actually been quite effective at attriting Ukrainian SAMs and forcing them to move further back from the front lines. So over time, the Russians have been able to move those kind of combat air patrols and those standoff um, ground attack sorties closer and closer to the actual front line um, within an acceptable level of risk. And that's really kind of the, the process that continues to now. Thank you, Justin. Um, Mongo, uh, I want to shift back to you. As a helicopter pilot, can you talk to us about what's going on uh, with the Russian helicopter employment? Uh, what threats are they facing and how are they trying to mitigate those threats? Yeah, sure, Slick. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to let you guys in a little bit of trade secret here. It's going to be a hot take, but as a helicopter pilot, pretty much everything is a factor <laughs> factor threat. So there's your hot take for the day. But uh, typically, I mean, everything is going to be a factor threat. So everything from your modern long range uh, SAMs, so your SA-10s, SA-20s, down through man pads, even down to small arms, and a heavy machine gun are all going to be all going to be factor factor threats. And so I thought it was pretty bold seeing uh, the onset of the uh, war. You see these mass helicopter formations pressing across the Ukrainian frontier, particularly in daytime. A uh, pretty bold tactic by the uh, by the Russians, especially considering, you know, you look at some of the latest data from the DOD, but through transfer sales and drawdown authority, there's over 1,400 stingers in that country right now. That's on open source. Doesn't even get into what our allies and partners are supplying the uh, Ukrainians. So a, a pretty bold strategy. But with that, we've seen increasing helicopter losses. So once again, kind of the failure of the Russians to gain any sort of air superiority, even localized air superiority, uh, inability to force package with CAS platforms to mitigate threats. Uh, as well as, you know, their lack of efficiency and effectiveness of some defensive systems, possibly due to decreased quantities of flares, which uh, Justin alludes to in his report. And then kind of the <clears throat> inability to employ low level or at nighttime has seen, you know, decreased, decreased effectiveness and increased casualties. So I think we've seen their helicopter forces basically relegated to, uh, ro- you know, lofted rocket attacks from behind, behind friendly lines, which if you know anything about helicopters, it's not how you effectively employ a helicopter. It's a line of sight platform needs to get a direct attack munition, whether it be an, an ATGM, a rocket, or a cannon on, you know, gain tally with the enemy and, uh, and employ weapons. So we've really seen helicopters are kind of relegated to a secondary role uh, due to some of those factors. All right. Now we're 10 months into the conflict. What lessons can NATO and other allied nations take from the air war so far? And what can be done in the air domain to empower Ukraine over the winter? Lucky, let's get started with you. Slick. I think that the biggest lesson that we all should take from the air war so far is that we cannot become complacent with respect to the air domain. Securing air superiority matters because that's the essential precondition for the success of every arm of our joint force operations. And we're seeing how difficult combat operations are for both sides because neither has been able to establish air superiority. I mean, and after all, if you're truly able to deny the use of the air domain to the other side, then why would you not exploit the air domain to the maximum extent possible to achieve advantage? Which is why I believe we have to reject this notion that air denial is enough. And that has implications for how we need to resource, train, and ready our forces, not just in the U.S., but with our allied partners and with NATO. So with respect to empowering Ukraine over the winter, I think the answer is yes. We have got to do everything we can to empower them to win as quickly and decisively as possible in every domain, air, land, and sea. And resilience and recovery matters too. And this is also probably a lesson learned that we need to uh, to take for another episode. What kind of civil engineering, logistical, and other infrastructure support should we provide to Ukraine to help them recover so they can continue to press with their combat operations? And on the air side, this includes providing Ukraine drones, ISR, training, expendables, and even fighter air. We have simply got to do everything we can to help them accelerate to victory. If I can uh, piggyback onto that, Lucky, I think uh, some of the takeaways I have here, one is the value of precision munitions and having a stockpile of those munitions. I mean, we've seen the Russians smoke through their precision munitions here in, uh, in 10 months, and you know, I think that's really crystallized a lot of things here in the West, and particularly here in the U.S. We're starting to see an increased appetite for things like a strategic stockpile, for uh, multi-year procurement contracts, as well as you know production of weapons above the min sustainment rate, which I think is very very important. Uh, we're also seeing a revitalization and, and galvanizing NATO. There were some who were arguing that NATO was an obsolete organization, but after February uh, 24th, that is no longer the case. We're seeing things like Poland spending 3% of GDP, you know, Germany's ordering F-35s, and we're going to see the rapid ascension of two very capable partners with Sweden and Finland, which are all very, very important. I think the biggest 
I think we can help Ukraine with this to remember this is a this is a righteous fight. So this is a righteous fight for the uh, for the West, regardless what you hear about in the media. This is not about NATO expansion. This is not about some sort of ancient Slavic reunification of some civilization. Like this is about one man re-adjudicating the end of the Cold War, and uh, particularly what his designs are for a post-Soviet world on uh, world on Eastern Europe. And so it's going to be important for us to support the Ukrainians through a long winter and into next year. Mago, amen on the uh, on the munitions. I think one thing that we saw in uh, in Justin's report, the Rusi report, is the need to have excess capacity, so stockpiles, and have that uh, second echelon and excess capacity in virtually every single military um, military capability we have, but especially in the consumables, right? The consumables like muni- uh, like um, munitions, rockets, missiles, uh, et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, we and we have bordering NATO countries where we're able to move those munitions into Ukraine, which is not necessarily going to be the case in a, a situation like Taiwan, where we don't have that ability. Yeah. So I, I think there's, there's quite a lot of lessons um, learned. I mean, the, one of the difficulties, of course, is that because this is the first major force on force between you know industrial peer nations, uh, you know, at least since the Korean War. Um, there's a tendency for all the different components of all the different armed services in all the different countries to look at Ukraine and find ways of analyzing it to say this is is the ultimate justification for all the plans we wanted to do anyway. Um, which, you know, is, is there's, there's a phrase going around in policy circles at the moment, which I rather like, which is decision-based evidence making, um, <laughs> which uh, is, is really... Um, you, you see it a lot, you know, that those did the, the, the you know, artillery, of course, saying that this this shows that we should have had all the funding all along. And the, the, you know, the tank or saying this shows that the tank is not only not obsolete, it's the cornerstone of everything. And, you know, the log- logist- logisticians, to be honest, with the most justification going, see, we told you. <laughs> that's true. Um, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, the, I think the biggest, the, the biggest point uh, to, to raise as a sort of top level lessons learned, I think would be Russian intent as a security threat in military terms has not only not been blunted uh, by the catastrophic setbacks they've suffered since February, but it's actually increased. If you look at their demands, they've actually increased. And whoever the next Russian leader is, I don't, I don't think Putin is going to stay in power for too much longer. Um, within a couple of years, I expect you'll see somebody else um, just because of failure of this magnitude, you know, even if they managed to get some sort of ceasefire um, that, that preserved a tiny bit of what they've got beyond the February 24th um, and uh, you know start lines. And I don't think that's likely. Um, it would certainly be disastrous for Ukraine and disastrous for us if we gave the Russians that pause. Um, but because that intent hasn't changed. Uh, but you know, it's that we're not negotiating with people who want the world to be peaceful here. And we're also not negotiating with a power that's likely to, or indeed able to, in most case, in most scenarios, back down from a long-term, very serious, as they see it, existential confrontation with the West. So whether it's um, Patrushev, for example, the, the head of the FSB who, who, who takes over, or someone like Prigozhin, who yeah, is the head of Wagner, is, is you know, if anything, more unpleasant than Putin, but he's, he's also a lot more pragmatic. Um, more likely to do you know really deep um, you know, cooperate cooperative deals with with external partners like the Chinese the uh, the Chinese the Iranians North Koreans. Um, you know, in either case, this is not a threat that's going away. There is no route back to normal um, out of this. And however we want to reconfigure our forces, um, we we probably have three to five years at most before Russia is in the position to try and reestablish conventional deterrence, it, it, you know, take the next step on redrawing the post-Cold War order as they see it. Um, and so we, we need to be ready for that. And it takes three years to order a new missile. So, um, you know, we, it, it sounds like a long way away, but it really isn't in defense planning terms. The other thing I would say is a really clear lesson from the way that the war has been fought is that we don't want in the West to fight a war like this. Um, and so going back to that point about air, air denial not being a, a, an acceptable target, it's not an acceptable target if we don't want to field massive, you know, 700 to 1,000 to a million man uh, or, or you know, personnel forces, you know, ground forces with 
you know, millions of stockpiled artillery rounds, expecting tens or hundreds of thousands of casualties in a major war. Um, we, we need the air power component to work as advertised for that not to be a thing. And so what we're going to need is an answer in more serious terms, not just to the suppression and destruction of enemy air defenses problem, which is a huge problem both in the, the Indo-Pacific, particularly for the US and its allies there, but also in Europe, because Russia's ground-based air defenses have worked pretty much as advertised, and in some cases better than advertised, uh, throughout this war, with the exception of the SA-22 Pantsir, which which when on the move and, and operating alone is, is, is not very effective, although when in place and operating as it's designed to do, which is to protect larger systems from incoming weapons, it's actually very effective. Um, we, we, we need to have answers to that suppression and destruction of enemy air defenses problem, and that will take money and capacity. So it can't just be, and we as air forces in the West need to do more in addition to what we're currently doing. It's going to be a case of choosing quite a lot of current activities and lasting activities that we are not going to do anymore in order to generate the money, but also crucially the, the flying hours, so the maintenance capacity, the spares capacity, the air crew, both mental and time and, and you know, kind of training capacity to actually go after the CAD admission set. We also have to accept that air forces, in order to be credible, particularly in Europe, are going to have to have an answer to the inevitable Russian blackmail, which would come from any, you know, the start of any clash where you know, NATO ground forces would be generally outmatched and outgunned at the point of, of confrontation. So if we were to use our air power, the Russian blackmail would be, well, we'll destroy it all on your basis. And, you know, concerns around escalation, well, fine, but yeah, it's, it's perfectly legitimate, I think, to target an enemy's air force if it's killing your troops. So, you know, we would have to have an answer to the large numbers of, we've seen very effective cruise and ballistic missiles that would come down on NATO air bases uh, in their home countries. Uh, the Russians have plenty of weapons, plenty of production capacity to rebuild in a multi-year period, and a reasonable number of launch platforms. So we're not only going to have to get after the CID piece, but also the, the resilience piece. And... You know, with the exception of the Swedes and anybody else who operates Gripen, which is designed from the, the ground up to be maintained where necessary from kind of mobile vehicles moving around, you know, lots of dispersed strips, and to a lesser extent, anything naval, because generally naval aircraft, the ground support equipment, things, for, you know, for example, for F-18, uh, both regular, you know, old, old school Hornet and, uh, and Rhino, you know, at least there, the hangar space is at a premium on ships so the ground support equipment is designed to be as compact as possible and is a bit easier to move around generally speaking we're not going to be able to either afford to or rejig our maintenance to to kind of operate in a really truly dispersed manner so it'll be a case of being able to move aircraft at least temporarily around existing bases in terms of civilian airports and diversion air bases and things like that luckily europe is covered in airfields um, with the security and the clearances and the training and the, the, the mobile teams that are required to do that, um, and the ability to take some hits on your main bases. So dispersing your, your maintenance tail a bit, rebuilding hardened aircraft shelters, because, you know, hazes went out of fashion um, after the Gulf War in many in many countries because it was shown that if you were able to to cycle tactical fighters overhead frequently and in many cases repeatedly hit them with laser-guided bombs, then yes, they were able to be defeated and targeted effectively. But of course, if you're talking about long-range standoff munitions, a single-caliber cruise missile or, or a single KH-101 is not necessarily a particularly good trade for one has which may or may not contain an aircraft especially with the escalation implications and the risk to the launch platform and the limited capacity that those assets have as a whole against NATO. So it'll be a mix of, of hardening some sort of agile combat employment type, um, you know, short-term dispersal capability to at least move aircraft when you need to, um, and some degree of air defense. So, for example, we've seen IRS, TSLM, and NASAMS, you know, probability of kill between 0.9 and 1% against even advanced Russian cruise missiles when used in Ukraine. Well, that's great. That means that even a battery next to each of the not very numerous main operating bases can significantly increase the number of missiles Russia needs to put, to, to put onto it in order to guarantee an effect. So it, it's that mix of, of hardening and, and dispersal capabilities that, we, that we're going to have to look at. Um, all of it's going to cost money. And ultimately, 
you know, it's not just a case of finding more money. It's going to be a case of deciding not to do some things in order to afford to go back to the basics properly. But yeah, the final, final kind of drawing it together lesson, I guess, would be combat air is, is and, and air forces as a whole, their, their primary duty is control of the air. And that is control of the air over anywhere you or your allies might have to fight in a non-discretionary con context. And that unfortunately now includes Eastern and Northern Europe. And so, you know, if you can't meet that non-discretionary task, your air force isn't constructed right. And a lot of things that we think of as, as essential features from 30 years of counterinsurgency, if you were to look at the sort of threat the Ukrainians are facing and that we very well could face in three to five years in Europe, especially if we're not ready for it, um, the Russians are opportunistic. They're not going to start a war. They don't think they can win. Um, but you know, we wouldn't be acting this way if we were under their threat in terms of the sort of prioritization decisions that are being taken. So I think getting real about the fact that we're not going back to normal um, in Europe and indeed, especially in the Indo-Pacific, where you know, even for European powers, that means the Americans are going to be very much in the Indo-Pacific um, with the bulk of their forces from here on out. So you know, how much less secure is our air power picture even than currently kind of visualized if you take a lot of the assumed American components out, yeah, we, we, we've got a lot of work to do. In many ways, it's a, it's back to the future, right? Yeah. Well, thank you all. This has been a fascinating conversation. The situation, uh, you know, that few of us thought we would ever see in our lifetime uh, with major war on the European continent is here. Uh, it's a war that many thought would uh, be over in a matter of days or weeks and now appears to be uh, nowhere near a settlement. So we'll continue to monitor and extract lessons using the great analysis like the con we had uh, from our friend Justin and to all of you. So thank you so much. Slick, thank you so much. This was a great episode. And as always, we're always super happy to have uh, Justin here with us. Yeah, Slick, thanks for the opportunity and Justin. Awesome report. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been great. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.